in a tent hiding spot. This is based on the story, but how the absolute living hell did William get away with this, okay? Hiding the bodies in animatronics? Dude, the smell of rotting bodies would absolutely ruin anything. And the heat from the animatronics moving would speed up the actual decomp of the bodies inside this, making it worse. And the animatronics are in front of other children every single day, okay? Like, parents even started complaining that the animatronics were leaking mucus and blood, as well as, quote, smelling like death, okay? If this was real, and William getting away with this wasn't important for the story of the games, he would have been caught instantly. They never found the bodies of these kids. Like, oh, we never found the bodies of these kids that supposedly went missing in this pizza place. But now their animatronics are starting to leak blood and are reporting to smell like death. Hmm, maybe we should check these out. Oh man, look, five dead bodies corresponding to different victims that went missing on the premises. William, you're under arrest. See, like I don't get how this wasn't cut and dry. How this didn't just, how? In at nine, Mrs. Afton's death. This is more so embarrassing because of the community as a whole. The story of Mrs. Afton, if there even is one, is a mystery that we've been debating for ages. A story that hasn't even had a slight amount of explanation, okay? No references, no mention of an actual name, nothing. So naturally, there are theories. However, these theories have no actual base in game lore, and instead focus on FNAF animated music videos, and stories, and fan fictions that are treated as canon, and sometimes heavily so. The truth is that we have no idea yeah, what happened to Mrs. Afton currently, all right? We don't even know if there really was a Mrs. Afton or if it was just like a baby mama or a one night stand or like maybe William ended up having like a surrogate so that he could have children of his own, all right? His kids may also just be adopted. There's a whole series of explanations as to what can actually be the case. But either way, for some reason, okay? And I don't know what really caused this to pick up. A load of people think that Mrs. Afton died in a car accident. Like, I mean, it's a possibility. That doesn't mean that it's canon, okay? Technically, there is infinite possibilities, okay? I mean, there are also others that think that William killed her or that she just left him because she found out what he was into, but then again, for some reason, she would also have had to leave him with his prime demographic. Others think that the reason that she left was because he started killing. Others think that she died in a plane crash, and you know what? All are equally possible, but nothing is actually canon, so stop treating it like it is, because frankly, it's embarrassing. In a Princess Quest, another embarrassing moment for William, all right? The whole reason he made Princess Quest a thing in the first place was to lock Vanessa away and prevent her from regaining control of her body whenever William needed it, okay? So why the hell did William create the, some sort of fail safe to let her escape? Like, okay, maybe he didn't expect Gregory to come along, or maybe he did and figure it out, I don't know. But given the track record of this series and the amount of times William himself, just alone, has been burned, literally, you think that he would have smartened up already. But, you know what? He didn't. And you know what? It's like having a self-destruction button, okay? It's like having some something on the inside of the Iron Man suit or on the outside of the Iron Man suit that someone can just tap and then boom, it doesn't work anymore. Like why? Why would you do that? It's stupid. If you want something to work, why give it away to not work? Like this is, this is one of the dumbest things that William has done. In it's seven, Mike Trap. The Mike Trap versus Will Trap debate, at least in our comment section, seems to be over. Well, at least it was until other videos went out because, you know, people are going to start trolling again. However, the debate over who is in the Spring Trap suit suit is sometimes still heavily debated on other comment sections and like on Reddit. And this is specifically thanks to the final scene from the sister location final cutscene that involved the final speech from Michael and the reappearance of Springtrap, confirming theories about him surviving the Fazbear Frights fire. However, the appearance of Springtrap accompanied by the line of I'm going to come find you left some people thinking that Michael was the one in the Springtrap suit instead of William, also leading to the conclusion that Michael was the purple guy instead of William, which is also wrong as confirmed by Scott when he said check MatPat's explanation on the subject, which MatPat concluded that Michael had no way of being the purple guy and thusly is not Springtrap. But you know, people are still yelling about it. Even Scrap Trap reignited this debate. Like people now think, or at least used to also think that Scrap Trap was Michael or William, and that Springtrap was William or Michael. And it's six Pizza Bot. 
One of the most interesting things to me in Security Breach was the Pizza Bot mini game, where you choose to go to the bottom of the Pizza Plex, and then like you go through the vent and try to escape the Pizza Plex instead of going through L chips. At that point, you end up getting locked in a security office where Chica is outside the only working door. So to lure her away, you need to make a pizza using one of the chef bots. So then she goes and gets the pizza, and then you can leave through the door. It's actually like a really cool look into like the Fazbear Kitchen and how it operates now, with service bots kind of taking up the position of people because they can be unpaid but also I'm guessing are more reliable to not kill people than humans which is kind of funny when you're talking about this series however the funniest part about it was when I got stuck in the sauce machine and decided to say oh no Steph Chica and that's what made this embarrassing for me I said on a different video I would talk about it at some other point and this is that point okay I don't know how it happened but when I was making the pizza I got phased into the sauce machine which resulted in me being unable to actually finish the pizza so I just had to wait to be jump scared to retry. But while I was waiting, I decided to say, oh no, Step Chica, I'm stuck in the sauce machine. I hope nobody comes by and licks sauce out of my, and then I won't finish that sentence because I think it's fairly evident where I was going. Yeah, that was a low moment for the barnacle. How about doing it number five, real life. The Twitter account Diamond Zia on June 27, 2020 tweeted out three photos with the line, FNAF will be real in 48 hours. These pictures were of news articles. One from USA Today titled, five children have gone missing inside Chuck E. Cheese. Parents report smells coming dot dot dot. One from Associated Press called quote post hour worker at Chuck E. Cheese reported dead at 27. And a final one from the something news titled night shift worker at Chuck E. Cheese claims strange movements from animatronics during post hours. However, this title had animatronics spelt incorrectly. <laughs> it said um, amicatronics. Everyone is freaking out and pictures of the articles, particularly the first one, were shared all over the internet. People were like absolutely absolutely spamming everyone, especially because this was around the time where Chuck E. Cheese had announced its closure. However, people didn't realize that these were fake. How are they fake, do you ask? It's easy. They just edited the source code, okay? Because you can change what anything says on a website, but it will only change for you until you reload the page, okay? And you can do this by editing the source code. You just need to find the aspect you're looking for, and then you can change what it says. Once you do that, you can do basically whatever you want. You can even change pictures, okay? So whoever made the original image just found an article from USA Today. It didn't even have to be about Chuck E. Cheese because they could have changed the picture and they just changed the title to five missing children going missing and like the same thing with the other articles. Hence why there were only images of the articles and not actual links. It was a hoax that blew up and people actually believed it and some still do. In it for disturbing desires. So this is something that I've noticed in the comments that actually worries me as well as pretty embarrassing. So we've made a series of videos about how we could turn the closed Chuck E. Cheese restaurant into FNAF joints, okay? Or even like just one ideal location. Not in Utah, though, ironically. But you see, in the comments of those videos, which you should totally go watch, by the way, then share them with Scott because I want to kind of do that even if it's just open for like a week or a weekend. And I mean, like if Mr. Beast can open fast food, I'm sure Scott can make this happen, okay? The comments, though, on those videos are full of various people telling me how they think it would be a great idea because then they could die in the FNAF restaurant and go on to possess an animatronic. Uh, what? Why the absolute living f could you want that? First of all, okay, possession, not real. That's not a thing in real life. I've yet to see real evidence of it or anything else paranormal. In addition to that though, even going by FNAF rules, you would need to suffer in order to die and generate the agony that is needed to possess something. Since in FNAF, all possession is actually just a manifestation of your extreme agony grabbing onto something that's nearby, as we learned from Fazbear Frights and Dr. Phineas Taggart. Getting close to the end in number three, forgetting Foxy. I'm pretty sure that the Foxy mechanic was added to help keep the player from just keeping their screen down for the whole night since I don't think you can really get jump scared if you don't bring up the tablet with the cameras unless like you're looking to the wrong side of the office. So Foxy was a way to ensure that you actually had to load up the cameras and hold them back as a way to actually have the possibility of being jump scared. Because if you don't look at Foxy throughout the whole first night, he can actually jump scare you. However, forgetting about Foxy and not checking Pirate's Cove is a horrible idea, even if unintentional. My personal strategy is to put the camera on Pirate's Cove when you close the tablet so that 
that you make sure that when you open it the next time, Foxy gets his dose, okay? He gets his attention. And just like Peanut, the SCP, he, he'll stay in place. And that, that just makes sure that I don't forget about him either. Because my reaction time isn't fast enough to stop him from getting into the office. But ultimately, in a number two, purple versus pink. The purple versus pink guy debate is the Mike versus Will Trap debate, okay? But it's from the early days, when all we had to worry about was different colors and not like 14 different purple characters. This debate came after FNAF 2's Foxy Go 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 minigame, where some fans believed that the guy standing in the corner all smiley was a different group of dead kids and um, it was a different killer because he was slightly lighter. That's right, he was not the exact hexadecimal code for purple that we knew, so we thought it was a different person. And you know what? This is stupid. Don't do this, okay? They're all the purple guy. It says so in the FNAF like handbook or whatever it's called. It says purple guy, okay? He's the purple guy. Stop it. Leave me alone, okay? I only use the pink guy when I need an extra slot on a list because there's not enough William Afton versions or something like that, okay? It's purple guy. And finally, in a number one, the bite of 83. The Bite of 87 was one of the most mysterious moments in the entirety of the FNAF series, and it was introduced in the first game. Being introduced in the series into FNAF 1 from 2014, the Bite of 87 has remained one of the most debated points in FNAF history, and we can't quite agree on what happened. At first, we thought it was Golden Freddy who caused it, then Freddy, then Mangle, then Fredbear, then Toy Chica, then back to Mangle, and then everyone in between. And everyone has their own opinion on the subject, but for some reason, most people think that FNAF 4 is the Bite of 87. However, it's been confirmed that it's the Bite of 83. Okay, if you Google the Bite of 87 as well, you get pictures from FNAF 4, which is not helping. And I don't think it helped that um, one of the most famous lines Markiplier has ever said was, was that the Bite of 87? It wasn't, Mark. I'm sorry. Okay, it's been years. Everyone needs to stop it, okay? The Bite of 83 is FNAF 4, and I still see it in the comments today, so stop it. In a 10, Chica. The problem with this, it's embarrassing because every time I bring up Chica, I can't help but make some form of crude joke about her. And not like a stupid joke, like Kentucky Fried Chica, like I did for Top 10 Tastiest Animatronics, and for that thumbnail. Instead, what I did for number one of the Tastiest Animatronics list, where I put Toy Chica as number one, then said it was obvious as to why she was at the top, because she is one. Like, don't get me wrong, okay? I think that it was funny as hell, but that's still kind of embarrassing since, you know, like, it's a it's a fictional robot chicken, and I uh, and I make jokes about wanting to sleep with. I don't know any way to put that delicately, honestly. I mean, like, I made the whole top 10 tastiest animatronics list because I wanted to make that joke at the end about how Toy Chico is the tastiest. For real, that's why I made the list. <laughs> so I could just say that I wanted to eat Chica. Yeah, embarrassing. <laughs> that video was made when we only had 90 FNAF videos on the channel though. 300 later, and I cry anytime I hear a nose honk. And at 9, 5 honks at Cali's. And by Cali, I mean California. Since back in 2014 when the first FNAF game came out, Smosh Games did their first FNAF game bang, as they were calling it. Game. YouTube game. Where they all played a round of the game and the person who survived the shortest amount of time before getting killed had to put on a werewolf costume and dance around in the street in an attempt to get five cars to honk at them, only being able to take the costume off when they did. Now, this would have been more embarrassing if it wasn't Lasercorn who got punished, or maybe now I just think that that would be way too fun, but honestly, I remember this video so fondly, and the, at the time, I thought it was pretty embarrassing. Like, nowadays, I'd probably just do that for fun and instead of having to be forced to do it because I lost a game but still at the time it was pretty rough to watch not as rough as some of their other punishments wrestling and, and, and lubricant definitely comes to mind but these were the good old days of YouTube where people watched Minecraft mod reviews and my music taste was limited to Minecraft parodies oh and when I didn't talk about FNAF for eight hours a day and it ate mangle vent Eddie VR is one of the most popular VR tubers on YouTube currently with over six million subscribers at the time of recording. He was really put on the map though thanks to his FNAF VR Like a Mexican series, which he also continued with his FNAF Security Breach Like a Mexican series on his second channel, which also used to be his main channel. Long story. Anyway, when starting up his series, he was getting a feel for the game. This involved him popping into some of the mini games, freaking out, and then quitting. And after staking his head outside the office in FNAF 1, thus triggering a foxy jump scare, he hopped into the mangle vent repair level. Now, his initial reaction was that this doesn't seem too bad, but when the lights go out, he starts freaking out a bit. But when it really got embarrassing, but also hilarious, was when he started the level by flipping the first uh, lever, right? The one that's in front of you, 
that you have to get real close to. And then he went absolutely ballistic when Mango was right there in his face. Of course, he was calling it Mangoes, which made quite a few commenters more than a, a bit upset, but still. Absolutely hilarious, but I'm sure not for him. And at seven, Music Man! Now, a more recent embarrassing moment, or maybe it's not embarrassing to him, Matt Pat was reacting to the latest trailer, at least at the time, for Security Breach, when he sees a giant Music Man crawl out of a hole in the West Arcade, a sequence we now know as one of the best in the entire game. But his reaction to the character's first appearance, Iconic, with a very intense music man! MatPat flipped about being right with one of his many theories about the legs we see on screen in Freddy and Friends on Tour episode 304, where he claimed that the white gloves really indicated that it was going to be Music Man. But this moment was not only iconic, but kinda memefied, with me referencing it multiple times in various previous videos, and the internet even remixing this into a song that is so much of a jam even Snoop Dogg would bop to it. I mean, like, there's also the whole meme of crying child as a kid wearing any shirt with two stripes thing that was going around, and then I even used it in a thumbnail for Top 10 Gaming Elite. That's probably more embarrassing, but I haven't really gotten to talk about the whole Music Man thing, so I wanted to. And at 6, Panic. Honestly, looking back, panicking at all during a FNAF game is pretty embarrassing, since nothing can really hurt you, and while yes, in VR it definitely feels like you're really there, it's not really going to cause any danger to you. Although, I will say that I am a totally a little bitch when it comes to horror, okay? The first time I played FNAF VR, I played it on the channel. And I'm like, I'm already bad at normal FNAF, so playing it in VR was even worse, okay? I was even worse. Which resulted in me running out of power on the first night, which is kind of my signature move. So, as the slowed march of the Torridor started playing, I was freaking out, and I, I knew that that was pretty embarrassing. But not only that, I actually then proceeded to survive the night since the time hit 6am, thus making all that panicking worthless sand for nothing. I'll let you in on a little secret though, okay? Well, what you saw was embarrassing. The reason I find it so embarrassing was because I, I was closing my eyes in the headset. Yeah, I, I, had, I had planned on reacting to the jump scare sound since I would be able to tell audio-wise and I wouldn't have to deal with Freddy in my face, but uh, but yeah, closed my eyes in a VR headset because I'm a little bit Halfway through into number five, spring trap rule. One of the other most embarrassing things that while may not have happened to anyone or in any of the FNAF games is just the sheer amount of famous internet rule images and videos that, that there are for these characters. But like, okay, look with Chica, I get it. God damn it, there I go again. But the worst one of all, at least I think on the embarrassment scale, is spring trap rule, turn it whore. Art. That rule being for anything you can find on the internet, somewhere, somehow, there will be an adult version of that content. And unsurprisingly, FNAF and even Springtrap are not immune to this rule, unfortunately. But just think about that for a second, please. Most people consider William Afton to be dead, even if he's not actually dead. Which means that most people who look at this are looking at a dead serial killer's rotting corpse stuck inside an animatronic that has shoved every inch of him with metal and rope robotic bits and thinking, damn, that's sexy. I've had people DM me these forms of spring trap images before. Like, bro, what? Why? Like, he's literally a, a man who should be dead, but is being kept alive by the spirit of one of his kid and you want to see him flog the dolphin? This is the reason that God left in Supernatural. God has left the chat. Jesus has left the chat. Allah has left. Everyone has left. The Satan has left the chat. And at four, FNAF 4 prediction. Oh, look at that. Once again, Matt Pat is on this list. However, I've made enough digs at myself. I'm like, it's kind of equal, so I think it's allowed. But during the build up to FNAF 4, we really had no idea what was going on. And then once it released early on, Matt Pat thought that he had won, saying that in a rush to actually release FNAF 4, Scott missed a huge detail that made the game actually impossible, without even pointing out how anything is possible in a series about animatronics being possessed by the souls of the children and a killer who literally can't die, the entire theory relied on the point that this was the bite of 87, something that last time I noted is one of the most embarrassing debates in all of FNAF history, saying that if the frontal lobe of the brain had been removed by an animatronic, the kid that we play as wouldn't feel fear, thus the nightmare animatronics were impossible. And you know what? This would have been true, had this have been the bite of 87. However, we now know that that is not the case. But since 
MatPat was stuck in con season, we'll give him a bit of a pass here. But seriously, looking back, it's it's pretty cringe, especially with what we know now. Like, looking back on any past theory, especially my own when more evidence comes to life, is a pretty rough deal, but uh... Yeah. Getting close to the end and in number three, The Puppet. The Puppet is one of the most iconic characters ever in the FNAF space. The character that gave life to other animatronics and William Afton's first victim. But also one of the simplest characters to contain. All you need to do in FNAF 2 to avoid the puppet is keep the music box wound. The game even tells you when it's running out of juice with a flashing icon on your screen, and then even a flashing icon next to the camera that you need to go to to wind up the box. So imagine how embarrassing it is to get jump scared by the puppet when the game gives you a million warnings that you're about to be jump scared. Yeah pretty embarrassing. And it's even worse in FNAF VR, since thanks to the way that it's set up, you just need to keep your finger on the wine button and then use your other hand to worry about the lights and the Freddy mask. That's it. It's one of the easiest FNAF VR levels because of this. But people still get jump scared by the puppet. And it's unfortunate, really, but still creepy because the way the puppet walks up to you in FNAF VR. At least like that way you literally see it coming, although at that point you also can't really stop what's happening. It explains how he got there, though. He didn't just jump from his room and go around corners. And ultimately, in at number two, was that the bite of 87? Markiplier is commonly known as the FNAF King. Some consider Doc the FNAF King, others Matt Pat. And despite our over 400 FNAF videos, nobody really thinks that I'm the FNAF King, despite me literally having King in my username, but that's fine, I'm not salty. However, the biggest embarrassment, at least in my eyes for Mark, was the infamous line, was that the bite of 87, said after watching Crying Child get chomped on at the end of FNAF 4. Now, this was indeed not the bite of 87, but this single line sent the internet spiraling. Now, some people still, to this day, fight that FNAF 4 is the bite of 87, which it's not. The game takes place in 1983, okay, and it was, it was confirmed as such in Sister Location. But either way, I've had multiple people follow me on either Instagram or TikTok, which you should totally follow, by the way, because I'm posting more FNAF content on there. But a lot of these users have had their names as some version of this line. The one I can remember the most, which is probably because it was the first one, was was that the bite of underscore 87. And then after that, a whole lot of them came. I don't know why. I mean, like, it's probably something that Mark wants to forget, but I'm sure that Markiplier simps love it. Yeah, that's right, Jada, I'm looking at you. What do I need to do to be the FNAF king? God, I've only made videos for a year. And finally, in a number one, left eye. This is definitely not gonna help with the whole FNAF King thing. However, it's more of a case of not being the Direction King. So back when FNAF VR first came out, I was playing it on the channel a couple of times. Actually, no, this was after, this was like two years after it first came out, but when I first got it. Like I mentioned previously, I was secretly closing my eyes because again, I'm a little However, the most embarrassing time for me was when I was trying to do parts and service levels. It starts off with Bonnie, and in Becoming the Purple Guy in FNAF VR, which is a video on the channel that you should check out, the first instructions are to remove Bonnie's left eye. Now, I pulled out the left eye, but I kept getting jump scared, so I figured I was doing it too slow or too fast, or I was hitting Bonnie instead of just pulling out the eye, so... I, I tried it, and I and I kept trying, and I tried a lot, each time getting jump scared. And it wasn't until after the video, after I had filmed it and was editing it, that I realized that I was pulling out my left instead of Bonnie's left, which is a really stupid way of putting it, but I guess it makes sense given the series we're talking about here. Yeah, that was a rough one. I loved the, like, loved the comments on that video though. I was red faced for like a month after this until I finally got my redemption. And it's in killing where you eat. The biggest mistake that William ever made, in my personal opinion, and I will say this until the day I die, was the fact that he killed people in his restaurant, okay? It's unknown if this was always his intention, but like, Come on, who would think that this is a good idea? Like, who in the comments wants to come at me and try to justify killing your prime demographic in your place of business, okay? Dealers don't kill their customers, okay? Mechanics only bleed their, <laughs> their clients dry of their money, not their blood. So like, why would William think that this is a good idea? Literally go anywhere else. This is just like, it's basically killing in your house and then like calling the cops and saying, hey, I killed someone in my house. It's putting unwanted attention and scrutiny on literally everything you do just so they can try to catch you. Like you even end up getting banned from going back into your building when the investigation is underway. And it's not like it helped your business. You had to close the first location because of this, resulting in you having to open another one that killed your daughter. So... 
yeah. Pretty embarrassing if you ask me. All you had to do was go to the park or some random alleyway or like a laser tag place and then boom, your kids would be alive, you'd be harder to suspect, and you'd be rich from your business because honestly, it was a good idea, but um, you're done. <laughs> and a nine Cassidy. Assuming for this scenario that Cassidy is the one you should not have killed, this was also one of the most embarrassing things that William could have done. Or maybe he doesn't consider it a mistake, because like the one you should not have killed is kind of keeping him alive after all, although it's still unclear if they're doing that currently or not. But they're doing it as a way to make him suffer. So I feel like getting possessed by a child is pretty embarrassing. <laughs> I, I mean, that like depending on the angle that you want to like look at, that I'm going with, I'm going with it's embarrassing. If I was possessed by a child, I would be embarrassed. Um, I don't think I am, hopefully. But even if he does like consider this a good thing, or if Cassidy doesn't end up being the one you should not have killed, which in my opinion she's not, but like killing those five kids that made up the missing children's incident that like landed with Cassidy, um, that was, that's, dude, come on, we already talked about it. You killed in the wrong place. It's embarrassing. So, you know what, if you don't want to count Cassidy as the embarrassing mistake, count the missing children's incident as that mistake, all right? Um, just, just count it whatever way you want. It's on the list, deal with it. <laughs> and it ain't Charlotte. Well, yes, Charlotte may have been Afton's first true kill, causing his descent into absolute freaking madness. This, in the game, Charlotte ends up possessing the puppet, who then gives life to the other animatronics, which causes you to disassemble them and release their spirit. In both universes where William kills Charlotte, it comes back to bite him in the ass since Henry comes after him for it. Which results in what should be his death multiple times over. And, not to mention how in the book specifically, unbeknownst to her at least, she is an animatronic robot that was meant to replace the daughter that Henry had lost. But it was also revealed that the animatronic is also Baby. You know, the Baby animatronic that we all know and love? Yeah, who can switch between her forms at will, and then the human version doesn't remember being Baby. So yeah, Charlotte in the books is also Baby, which is also, in the games, William's daughter. And it's seven hiding spot. Okay, again, how the absolute living hell did you get away with this? The smell of rotting bodies would ruin any place that you're in, okay? It doesn't matter if you're eating, if you're dancing, I, I don't know, committing murder. The smell of rotting bodies always puts a damper on things. And the heat from the animatronics moving on like like all their insides, because you know, it's heat. It would speed up the decomposition and make it stink even worse, because heat always makes things worse. And the animatronics are in front of people every single day, okay? they you, People even started complaining that the animatronics were leaking blood, as well as, quote, smelling like death. If that was real life, William would be gone, okay? There's, he would have been caught instantaneously. Like, oh man, we never found the bodies of these kids. Wait, hold up. These animatronics are leaking blood, smell like death. Call Agent Booth. We need to check these. Then they found the missing kids. All right, Afton is under arrest. He, they already suspected him. And I mean, like, having bodies hidden in your animatronics where you're the s technician for the suits and uh, also, I don't know, the CEO, yeah, you're you're instantly incarcerated. I don't, I don't I don't know. I don't know how this wasn't just a clean cut case. Okay, I know that was important for the story of the games, but it just it shouldn't have happened. All right, his whole plan is a dumpster fire of embarrassment, and I love it. And at six, Henry, why did you think that killing Charlotte wouldn't have any consequences, okay? Like, you killed your business partner's daughter. That was probably pretty obvious to him, especially since he already suspected you were up to something, and he took extra care to protect his daughter, and then she still died. That is 100% the superhero origin story that Henry needed. A vengeful father if I have ever seen one, and he didn't even need vengeance when he was putting that green bracelet on his daughter. So then you know what? Then he's after you, or it seems like it, and you don't kill him next? Like, killing Henry would have done so many wonders for your criminal career. I mean, like, yeah, the cops were already suspicious of you. As long as they can't find a body, they've already said that, like, they, they can't arrest you without a body, apparently. So if, if they won't put you away for five missing kids, they won't put you away for a missing father as well. Especially a jury who has to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that you're the killer. 
And I mean, like, I don't know, that's kind of up in the air, and I did, like, you'd rather not go to trial if you were being charged with murder, but, but still. Without a body, there can't really be any forensic evidence, so if you just, I don't know, throw it in a wood chipper. Again, these videos are going to be the reason I get hauled into the police station. Halfway through into number five, Elizabeth. Speaking of mistakes, <laughs> let's talk about his own daughter. I get it, get it, because she's a mistake. Actually, we don't know. She might be. I don't know how William thought that like this was a good idea though. Like, I I feel like this guy like trying to brainstorm how to capture kids more efficiently. And like, he hadn't even started killing at this point. He's like, oh, I know, I can make a robot to lure them in with ice cream and then grab them where they're close. Okay, so um, well, what's it gonna look like? Oh, let's call my daughter and ask for some design tips, you know? Then, then like Elizabeth ends up making the most predictable move ever and going directly against her father's instructions like a kid to go see the robot. That's basically perfect in her eyes. William. Why? Why did you think that this wasn't going to happen? You had to lock your child in his room so that he wouldn't go to Freddy Fazbear's f***ing pizza and you think that your daughter isn't gonna walk up to an animatronic, especially at the age where they want to piss you off. And they're also seemingly loaded because you own a successful entertainment business, okay? Spoiled rich kids listening to their dad to, when they say to not touch a giant robot that was made to appeal to kids. Yeah, that's gonna work. God, you're a special kind of stupid. It's embarrassing. That, it is embarrassing. It is truly embarrassing, bro. Okay? All you needed to do was have a blacklist and say, don't kill these kids. And you would have been fine. But no. And at four, fun times. Now, there's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. These are clearly state of the art. There are just certain design choices that were made for these robots that we don't fully understand. We were hoping you could shed some light on those. Well, she can dance, she can sing. She's equipped with a built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. Yeah, with all due respect, those weren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. Yeah, that classic line of William seemingly being interrogated by the police that plays the first time you open up sister location is definitely showcasing how embarrassingly stupid this guy is. The cops know what these animatronics are doing and are capable of and what were what they were designed to do. So they instantly end up being even more suspicious of him and Considering like the circumstances, we can also assume that Elizabeth is inside the robot. Like, there's no way that they confiscated the animatronics before they had to close circus babies. So she is definitely still inside the robot. So they're definitely keeping a closer eye on him and his daughter's in a robot that they're asking him about, okay? Bro, yeah, why? Designing the fun times as killbots before seemingly you actually had the rest of the FNAF roster? Definitely an embarrassing moment. Especially considering how one of the fun times was meant to symbolize your dead wife. I don't wanna I don't wanna know how you were trying to fill that one with souls, bro. Leave me out of it. Getting close to the end in number three, cry child. I have a I've had a ton of people complain to me about how Crying Child's death wasn't William's fault, since he wasn't the one who put Crying Child's head in Fredbear's mouth, okay? And then the spring locks were failed because he was crying. But let's be honest, there is no logical way that that animatronic jaw should have crushed his skull. Even the spring locks, okay? The spring locks weren't active and would have required a lot of power to actually accomplish this goal with like just like normal opening and closing power of a jaw. So the only way that Crying Child's skull could have been crushed was if Afton had intentionally, s for some reason, supercharged the jaw of the animatronic. Which, uh, it would make sense if he wanted to use it as a kill machine, like as a prototype fun time, or maybe he wanted to use it as a backup kill suit in case Spring Bonnie ended up failing. Figuring more power in the jaw would help him, which clearly it did, just in literally the worst way possible. Like, there's also no way that this is a spring lock failure, guys, okay? The suit was already in animatronic mode, meaning that the spring spring lock mechanisms that are the reason that it could fail because they're used to keep the robotic parts to the size that someone can fit in the suit weren't being used because it was in animatronic mode. So they don't need to keep the robotic parts to the side. The spring lock failure problem comes when those mechanisms are put under stress of having to keep the parts away from the person in the suit, okay? And then if they get wet, that's when they can loose and then 
That's that's why you, they can't get wet, okay? Keep in mind that the term spring lock in this context is being referred to the parts that move the robotic bits away inside the actual suit. Since the suit is also referred to as a spring lock, I feel like I kind of need to clarify that. And ultimately, in at number two, Princess Quest. The whole reason Princess Quest is a thing in Security Breach was to lock Vanny away and prevent her from regaining control of her body. So why did William create or allow for the creation of a fail safe to allow her to escape? I mean, sure, they didn't expect the size of a four-year-old kid to come along and figure it out, but given the track record of William, you'd think that he'd have smartened up after at least 40 years, but that's like having a self-destruct button on the thing that's gonna save the world, that the villain can just come up and go boop. That's like some Austin Powers level comedy. Or like if the Flash had a steal my speed button on like him anywhere at any point. It's just stupid. <laughs> if you want something to work, why well, give it away to fail? And then you let it happen. It fails because of a kid the size of a four year old. Maybe, not even. This is one of the dumbest, most embarrassing things that William has had happen. And probably like the third dumbest overall, okay? But seriously, what was the point behind the way to undo your evil plans? Well, that's like one of the most ridiculous, unbelievable things in a story about serial killers getting possessed and animatronic robots getting possessed. I know that it was like, like it was required so that we could have a good ending to this game, but like that ending isn't even canon, so we don't care about it. Okay, it just was one of the it was one of the dumbest things that has ever happened in this series. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? And finally, into number one, Springtrap. Being the genius behind some of the most advanced robotic technology in the universe, we expect a lot from William, okay? He's the suit technician, he's the main killer, he seems to be the CEO of the company, so he should really know what he's doing, right? <laughs> Apparently not. Since after discovering that the original five animatronics were possessed, he disassembled them to learn their secrets. This inadvertently released the spirits of the original five victims, though, causing William to panic, which is understandable since firstly they're freaking ghost kids that he never expected to see again and also because they're the ghost kids that he killed. Okay, so this absolute animatronic genius, the technician that has handled the suit maintenance for years and has explained to every employee the proper procedure for the spring lock suits, including the spring body suit that he uses, ends up climbing inside the suit in a panic in an attempt to make himself feel more powerful and maybe scare off the ghost kids. However, he's so smart that he didn't notice the moisture in the room, the leaking ceiling, which causes the spring locks that were active at this moment since it was in suit mode to fail, which would have killed him had he not been possessed by the one you should not have killed. Yeah. Yeah, embarrassing. And it tend to Rockstar Row. During the so-called interrogation and torture scene in Parts and Service, or at least that's what people are calling it, from based on the titles of videos on YouTube. Vanessa questions Freddy about Gregory and accuses Freddy of helping us, which I mean is true, but she shouldn't even have to accuse him, more on that later. After telling him that she's gonna leave him down there until he can get put on a new endo, which doesn't really make sense if his coding is the issue and not the endoskeleton itself, why would she leave to Rockstar Row through Roxy's lift? Why? It, when she could have easily just come our way and head into the main atrium. That's where Gregory is for the majority of the game and that's where all the animatronics are patrolling and have been spotting him. It would make more sense to go there than to Rockstar Row where he was seen maybe twice at this point. Like, I don't know. It, it seems weird to me. I don't, I don't understand. Maybe like the whole logic behind this is that since all the animatronics are out in the atrium, she doesn't need to be there or maybe she needs to be somewhere where she can get to her vanny suit quickly, but I, I don't know. Even if it is Vanessa taking over and not like glitch trap at this point, I still don't get why she wouldn't just go to the atrium. In at nine, bag of rocks. <laughs> Before Vanessa leaves Freddy in parts and service, okay, she says that it's so that his casing can be put on a new endo after they probably have someone on the clock who can do it normally. But uh, then after that, she doesn't seem to be suspicious that he's walking around in front of her maybe within like three minutes. What? <laughs> Who would have repaired him if not for, like, if it wasn't Gregory? There, there's literally no other human in the Pizzaplex, or at least that's alive at this point, and, you know, Freddy can't really do it himself 
the, their, the whole cylinder thing is to protect humans, there are no staff bots in this section, and the only reason that you had to leave him was because nobody else was working. Hello? <laughs> you there, McFly? Like, why would Vanessa be so chill of, about Freddy just like walking around in front of her? She literally left him with his head removed, and like, and now she's like, what, assuming that he somehow did it himself, which is literally impossible as he was strapped down? Even if he had done it himself, why wouldn't she see him and then confine him to his room, especially after just accusing him of helping to protect Gregory, okay? It's something that confuses me inc like so much, and it, it, I found it weird in my first playthrough, so I figured that if we got close to Vanessa, she would pull us out of Freddy, but like, I walked up to her to test it and nothing. She gave absolutely zero shits. Like, why? She's dumber than a bag of rocks at this point. It would have been so easy just to make, like, that little modification to her code for at least this part of the game. Uh, like, making her a little bit more dangerous if she saw Freddy, but no, they didn't. In it, a princess quest. The whole reason princess quest is a thing in this game was to lock Vanessa away in her brain and prevent her from regaining full control over her body. So, why did William create or allow for the creation of a fail safe in this system that allows her to escape. I mean, like, sure, they didn't expect a kid to come along and figure it out, maybe, but first of all, it's an arcade machine. Of course, I'm gonna goddamn play it, but also, given the track record of literally all of your plans, you'd think that Afton would have smartened up after, like, 40 years at the very least, but uh, I, he doesn't, okay? It's like having a self-destruct button on the bomb that you plan to use to blow up Gotham City, okay? Or, like, like it's like, I don't get it. It's like if the Joker had a purify water supply button just on him or something, okay? It's dumb. If you want something to work, why give it a way to fail? Or maybe that's just my brain and my perfectionism talking, but again, it's one of the dumbest things that Afton has actually ever done in the series. Like, canonically, it doesn't backfire somehow, but that's aside the point. Like, but seriously, what, why, why would you have a way to undo your evil plans? A four-year-old can do this. The fact that this wasn't the canon ending is actually just insane how that didn't happen. Just bury the third machine, at least. God damn. Like, if that's the intention behind it, just bury it and leave it, okay? Fill it with concrete and leave it. Jeez. And it's seven stealing security badges. Not only is Gregory just a really weird kid in general who wears Fazbear merch but also doesn't know that Chica loves pizza, he's also a thief. This guy steals so many things from the Pizza Plex, not even including all the little gift boxes that you can find around that are only optional. He also steals the security badges and ends up getting enough to have level 7 clearance as like a 4 year old or a 6 year old or however old he is, okay, it's really unclear. Cause like he can't ride the go-kart alone and he can fit inside of Freddy's chest cavity but he can also speak full sentences with proper grammar and stuff, okay? I, I have no idea how old he actually is, but he is still able to gain level 7 clearance. But like, how are they so readily available for him to steal? And how is it that taking these badges always triggers some event that makes everything worse for him? Like, how are the security guards supposed to, like, use these badges if that's what happens every time they take it? Or, an even better question, actually, how are these security badges laying around in special containers when security should just have their pass with their clearance level on it, like on their belt. Okay, I don't get it. Plus, how does gaining multiple level 1 passes end up adding up to a level 8 clearance? That's all, it's still all level 1, okay? I don't get it. It makes absolutely no sense, and it's almost as if they set it up for him to see how long it would play out or something, or how well he would do. I don't know. And it's 6 fire. Okay, so during the true ending, otherwise known as the Afton ending or the burn trap ending or whatever the hell you want to yell at me for not calling it ending, we have to fend off burn traps attempts to take control over Freddy by setting him on fire using what I'm guessing are the mechanisms that Henry uses to set the fire in FNAF 6, since this is the same location. However, it's incredibly convenient how we fall into the room that has all of this stuff in it, that it has the monitors set up connected to the cameras in the various rooms that burn trap enters exclusively with buttons 
buttons that light the fires in the corresponding room that like has the camera on the monitor. Yeah, I despite it being far more convenient for Henry to light all of them at the same time, I don't get how this works. Plus, I mean like if you think about it, how are these still working? It's clearly been a while and some of the comments uh, report that the Pizza Flex has been open for at least four years, which I don't know if it is accurate because I mean it's the YouTube comments. But if it is, these cameras and old ass computers are still working four years after being set on fire that was enough to ruin the building. Not to mention also falling into a sinkhole that would have had to open up underneath it since we have to travel down an elevator to actually get into this section of the pizza place. How is all of this still working after all of that? And if you say that it was Vanny, that even adds more questions. Like why make sure the fire systems are working and then they're set to being separate buttons? Plus why have the computer monitors set up to look at the right area? I don't get it. And how are these computer like these computer monitors are literal dinosaurs. How did they work before the fire, let alone after it? This is the kind of thing that demonstrates the line between luck and intent because there was no way this many things lined up for him, excluding plot armor, because we kind of need to ignore protagonist syndrome for this entire list. But still, if this was just happening, that wouldn't that would not happen. Never. No way. How are we doing at number five? Ice cold captive. Gregory and the fast Blast ending actually orders the robots to disassemble Vanny since she just ordered them to disassemble Freddy. But like, disassembling a robot and a human are two very different things. Okay, I, trust me, I would know. I'm surprised the robots even listened to him. Adding on to that, the fact that Gregory is willing to kill Vanny here, it's pretty messed up, especially given that like most people assume that he's 10 or 11, which doesn't really seem to make sense. Either way, you could argue that he doesn't know any better, but clearly he does. Okay, this kid is able to destroy all three animatronics without a moment's hesitation, use their upgrades on Freddy, he's willing to kill Vanny despite seemingly knowing her like we see in the best ending, and then he burns Burn Trap multiple times to make sure he doesn't take over Freddy. Okay, what the living hell is this kid doing? Like, how was he raised? How is he so nonchalant about literally doing all of this? This guy kills Vanny and then only gets emotional when he has to go talk to Freddy, who is destroyed. Dude, Vanny is bleeding out not three feet from you. She is torn to shreds, and you're crying over a robot that can be fixed? Something isn't right about this kid. He's supposed to be the captive here, but he's the one putting everyone else in danger, I swear. In it for recharge. What's the deal with airplane food and Glamrock Freddy and needing to recharge every five minutes, okay? Like in the game sense, time isn't moving when I'm, when I'm running around for five hours since I haven't actually progressed the story. So if this animatronic is supposed to need to recharge every hour only, why is this such an issue? And why does he only use power when we're actually piloting him like a mech? If this is the case, shouldn't this man also be losing power when we summon him to grab us from the third basement floor? Like what? Why not? And why does he need to recharge, but seemingly all the other animatronics don't? I never see Chica, Roxy, or Monty in a recharge station. Okay, even if you are around when they should be, when the hour hits. Okay, it's stupid, it's confusing, and it doesn't make any sense. It's almost like Freddy is doing this to us on purpose. Either because he thinks that it's funny, or maybe he really is working for Vanny, but needs to gain our trust and make excuses for why he can't be around us all the time. So that he can just go and give her the information. Or why he can't just like why we can't hide inside of him all night, okay? There's something fishy going on with this animatronic, and I swear in the next game, we're going to figure out that he betrayed us off screen. Or at least in the DLC, we're gonna figure that out. Getting close to the end, into number three, destruction. And isn't it convenient that there is a way to break every other animatronic that isn't Freddy? Okay, that leaves the animatronic broken in such a way that we can remove whatever aspect we actually needed to upgrade Freddy? Hell yeah it is. It's so convenient in fact that there is somehow a way to break them that just works perfectly for their personality, and the perfect amount of the animatronics as well. That works the first time. And even with Chica, okay, we push her into a goddamn trash compactor and somehow don't get crushed ourselves despite her grabbing onto us and pulling us with her. We only get pulled down into another area of the Pizzaplex that we can still get back to the Pizzaplex through, and you know, we weren't pulled into a thing that crushed our skulls. So yeah, needless to say that looking at this logically, it makes absolutely zero sense that any of this 
actually happened. Okay, we didn't even need to crush the animatronics, and instead we could have just chilled in Freddy's room until 6 a.m. when the doors opened. And ultimately, in at number two, staying until six. Speaking of which, Glamrock Freddy straight up encourages Gregory to risk his life in order to get out of the pizza plex. When, in all honesty, the safest thing to do would have just been to keep him in your stomach or in your green room until 6 a.m. Especially after the door closes and he was definitely stuck. Which just it makes no sense. Whatsoever if Freddy is really meant to be protecting Gregory. There was no need for the whole daycare secret escape hatch thing. You could have just gone back the way you came and everything would have been fine. You wouldn't have been suspicious since you would have at least appeared to be like you listened to Vanessa after you saw her in the, the healing area and went actually back to your room. And then Gregory would have been safe, especially after you knew that there was some crazy bunny running around the pizza place looking to slaughter him. So yeah, if Glamrock Freddy is like supposed to be protecting him he did a horrible job at protecting this kid okay did i don't i don't understand you can think of all the excuses you want for him, but if Gregory had just waited in Freddy's green room, everything would have been fine. That's it. That's period. And finally, in at number one, our probable betrayal. I know that nobody wants to believe me on this, okay? We all want to hold out hope that finally one of the animatronics is going to be good and trying to help us, but Glamrock Freddy, after everything on this list, is almost certainly evil and just waiting for the perfect moment to strike. We've made a whole video about that, okay? And, and now, honestly, this one is kind of about that too. This guy makes some hella sketchy choices throughout our entire time at the pizza plex and only makes things worse for us. He takes us to get healed despite us saying no and having a limited time to leave, which ends up making us get locked inside the pizza plex. We also just sit in the booth and don't actually get healed, by the way, okay? He was unable to access the main pizza plex network despite having no reason to be disconnected since at this point he wasn't suspected of helping us. And after Vanessa leaves Freddy without his head and parts in service, she sees him fully reassembled in less than five minutes and doesn't question it, like I said. Almost as if it was the plan the whole time. There's no way that he could have been put back together normally, and they just don't care, okay? The only way that this makes sense, any of this makes sense, is that if Freddy is secretly evil, and maybe even he doesn't know it, maybe he, Afton is like in the back of his mind just like waiting to come forward. Number 10, Mermaid Chica. I don't think we really needed a, like a Chica mermaid, and yet that's something we got. Mermaid Chica appears in Security Breach, and she's actually originally from Help Wanted. She was more creepy looking there, actually, which is kind of awkward in its own way. But in Security Breach, Glamrock Mermaid Chica only appears as a cutout, and she is looking weirdly attractive and flirty? I don't know if it's just me seeing that, but her design has definitely been made less creepy and more cute at the very least. This version of Chica also doesn't have a cupcake, but instead has an oyster to supplant her little animatronic cupcake sidekick. And if you didn't already know, we have a new channel that you need to check out. It's the next biggest thing, and you'll want to be one of the first 100,000 subscribers. Trust me. It's Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. Press pause, go sub, then come back and join me as we count down. Number 9, Getting the Faz Watch. Another strange thing in the world is when you as Gregory berate Glamrock Freddy for talking so loudly. One, it's pretty awkward how inherently rude Gregory seems here and just in general. Freddy only seems to want to help, but Gregory constantly criticizes him for doing even that, complaining that the booming volume of his voice could all too easily attract the security guard Vanessa, who Gregory does not trust and doesn't want to find him. Which kinda also seems suspicious. What are you hiding, Gregory? Why don't you want security to find you? But the other weird thing is that before this, you were in Freddy's chest cavity, and in order for him to communicate with you without being outright heard, he decides to give you a faz watch. Now where does he keep said faz watch? Well, also in his chest cavity, which implies that during the time that you were in there before, you were actually sharing that very small space with a crank and a gift box, which is how you get the faz watch. Even though when you look in, to take that faz watch, it looks like this device takes up the entire space of Freddy's chest cavity. So how is that possible? Or does he just make faz watches appear out of thin air? I don't know. <laughs> Physics. Number eight, climbing inside Freddy. Another weird part of this entire thing, despite it being super cool as well, is actually climbing inside Freddy. That is because it definitely seems like you would not be able to fit inside his chest cavity. Even minus, like I said, the crank and the gift box, which are removed after you get the faz watch from Freddy. Still, even with that space cleared, it just looks way too small for how big the character is supposed to be. It kind of makes me think they should have designed Glamrock Freddy to just be like basically a giant booming 
character. He's already pretty giant, but I just feel like he needs to be even larger. So the scaling would work better in your mind. But also, then he'd probably be like way more intimidating and kind of scary. And they probably wanted to make sure he stayed, you know, kind of like approachable and friendly looking since he's supposed to be kind of like your pal in the game. So I get it, but it still is super awkward because it doesn't feel like it makes any spatially logical sense for at least enough for this to even be possible. Number seven, Freddy teleporting. This was something that was later fixed in the game, but initially it was kind of like a glitch or really just a choice in terms of the game's programming that was really creepy. Originally, when you summoned Glamrock Freddy, he would just appear near you. He wouldn't have to run over from where he was previously, but instead would be able to just like kind of shortcut to where you were by seemingly teleporting to your side as Gregory in the game, usually appearing behind you so that it didn't seem like he necessarily teleported, but it would be like no one's there there's Freddy. <laughs> so a little weird. This wasn't in canon teleporting. At least I don't think it was intended to be that way anyways. Just a choice made by the game designers on how Freddy would appear near you when you called him and you needed him. Later on this was patched and changed so that when Freddy came you could always pretty much see him running up as opposed to sneaking up behind you. Which admittedly was a little creepy and awkward but was maybe a bit more convenient too. Also, I don't even know if it was less creepy and awkward than Freddy like charging towards you, which is also kind of scary, admittedly. Number six, having a crush on Chica. Obviously, we all have a crush on Chica. There's nothing awkward about that, right? But there is something really awkward about how much Gregory seems to enjoy doing harm to animatronics. That for sure is awkward. Case in point, when we are forced as Gregory to get Chica into the trash compactor so we can literally have a crush on her by crushing her. Not only do you as Gregory turn on the trash compactor with Chica in it either, but you are also forced to literally push her into it and then watch as she's crushed right before your eyes. Though really, you'd think backing up here would make more sense. As a result of staying there to watch, you actually end up being dragged down into the garbage chute. And all because Gregory seems to be more obsessed with watching Chica like get crushed up close after pushing her in than his own safety. Which is also in itself pretty awkward and disturbing. Like I love how Gregory pushes her and then he's just like, yes. Yes, be destroyed. <laughs> Gregory is definitely gonna grow up to be an interesting adult. Number five, taking Roxy's eyes. It doesn't end with crushing Chica. It really only continues to get worse from there. Although I guess if like me, Chica is one of your favorite animatronics, then it already starts out pretty bad. I don't know about you, but I really didn't want to crush Chica. With Roxy, at least for many of us, she's kind of like one of the most annoying characters in this game. Although, of course, if there are any major Roxy fans out there, please let me know in the comments. If you actually happen to like like Roxy, that's cool too. If you don't find her annoying, that's fine, but she kind of annoying. With Roxy though, we literally need to take her eyes out of her head, which is well, there's no other way to say it. It's pretty gruesome. And once again, Gregory does this all by himself, which is disturbing, awkward and disturbing. I mean, we don't see it, but we hear it. We know what's happening. Number four, confessing to Freddy. Another bizarre thing that happens in the game happens as the result of you as Gregory stealing all the animatronics parts to, you know, upgrade Freddy with. You basically have to confess to Glamrock Freddy at one point that yes, you stole these pieces from the bodies of his friends. Basically, dismembering and mutilating them. Which, yeah, it just, it doesn't sound too good, does it? It's already awkward enough to have to do this in game and watch as Gregory does so almost with seeming delight. But then to hear how casually Gregory plays off, you know, sharing where these pieces came from and to hear Freddy be so sad about it? Oh boy, it's an awkward conversation to listen in on. Never mind technically be a part of. Freddy's like my friends and you're like, well, you know how it is. Sometimes I gotta destroy your friends, Freddy. Just don't worry about it. I'll be your friend. I'll be your friend. Number three, Vanny defeated. The ending where you can just choose to go for Vanny is like a weird one. Especially as it starts off with Freddy, as you finally have the option to leave the pizza plex asking you if you want to stay, leave, or you can also choose Vanny. The choice is yours. Will you stay or go, Gregory? Um, 
Vanny. Lol, <laughs> what a strange response even. Vanny. If you choose Vanny as a bizarre answer to a question that had nothing to do with her really, then you will go after Vanny, attempting to get her where her home base is in the game at Phaser Blaster. Once there, there is no way to play through this apprehension really. Kind of it kind of just happens with you not really getting much of a say in how it plays out. You're more a witness than an active participant, I would say. Freddy is immediately taken off the board and then you're forced to pursue Vanny and order her loyal animatronics to turn on her, dismantling her to defeat her. What is so messed up about that? Well, you're dismantling her and she's not an animatronic. She's like a flesh and blood person. So that's pretty messed up. Dismantling. Number two, comic book endings. One of the weird things about security breach in general is the endings that we get where we don't even really get complete like animations or cinematics. Instead we get some like moving comic book pages. It just seems weird and awkward that the rest of the game is like really polished and yet they decided to go with this for all of the endings. Like you don't even really get to play through them even though they seem to have parts to them in terms of the story that seemed like they would actually be kind of fun to play. I'm not sure if this is just a weird style choice or if this was just because, you know, they didn't want to spend the time or money incorporating the ending scenes into the same style of animation and gameplay as the rest of the game and or making them like, you know, just more playable in general as opposed to something that you just kind of watch happen in a comic book form and then you're like, well, I guess that's the ending. Cool. Number one, the elevator. Probably one of the most awkward parts of Security Breach is the elevator interludes. When you have to get in the elevator with Freddy and you're just kinda there for a while. Especially because as soon as you're in close quarters, it becomes clear how weird and freaky Freddy is just in general. As soon as you're forced to focus on him, you'll notice how he creepily just like stares at you, almost obsessively. And because you're in close quarters, Glamrock Freddy will continuously kinda just open and close his chest cavity, preparing or like offering for you to like jump inside it. It just seems seems really sinister even though he's you know he's your friend and you know Freddy wouldn't harm you but you can't help but question this odd behavior or at least you're definitely freaked out by it it's just a weird time I feel like when I'm in the elevator I'm like just don't look just don't look at Freddy look anywhere else